Tim Austin must put a lot out of his mind. Anticipation builds anxiety. Anxiety is the enemy of athletes. And Austin has to overcome 15 days wait and the loss by Eric Griffin in order to advance in this tournament. Beasley Reese uh, got a chance to talk to Joe Bird about Austin's uh, chances and his advice to him. Beasley, what did he tell Tim? Bob, the number one tip that he gave him was to keep his left hand up high to keep his opponent from coming over the top with his left. And as you can see, both uh, fighters are left-handed. So that's the reason for that suggestion. He will obviously adjust after a good look in the first round. Al, how does uh, Tim Austin... Uh, work with a 15-day layoff here what psychologically does he have to do for himself I, I think that Tim Austin's the kind of guy who normally is pretty well prepared it takes him a round or so to get into bouts sometimes and so as a result of that now there we had Tim Austin throwing two punches and a punch a point goes up for Strogoff so uh, already we're into a bizarre situation that was a caution to Strogoff's corner for coaching not allowed in amateur boxing Tim Austin must stay with what his, is his normal game plan. Use his jab effectively and throw a solid straight left hand. For 112 pounds, Tim Austin possesses a great deal of power. It's hard to imagine a kid who is built like wrought iron, not thick in any part of his body, can produce that kind of power in his punches, but he does. He is working very hard on his straight left hand. He wants it to be even more powerful. He sparred a lot with Eric Griffin, and their sparring sessions, as we mentioned when Griffin uh, boxed, they said people would pay to come and see him, probably. They were terrific, and it helps Tim Austin a lot. He's going after the Bulgarian, uh, Strogoff, not to much avail in the scoring department, but he is pursuing him and, and being the aggressor. As much as the uh, International Boxing Committee wanted the scoring system not to be a factor in this 1992 Olympics. It has, in fact, been a big part of this Olympics. Its uh, pluses and its minuses have been, to this point, uh, closely scrutinized. A lot of people don't like it. Some people feel like it's the only way that amateur boxing can stay in the Olympics is to have an electronic scoring system like this. Tim Austin is boxing the first round, not surprisingly, not perfect for him. He's, he doesn't get off in the first round as much often as you will in the second or third. And you'll probably see a different Tim Austin, more aggressive and a little sharper in the second round. And another caution to Strogoff's corner for uh, coaching again. Of course, uh, three cautions produces a warning and points can be added to Tim Austin's score. So Strogoff's corner has to be very, very careful here. Austin takes the lead again. The electronic scoring system we are getting this straight from the touchpad, the computer. That's the official scoring. That's the way the scoring in boxing is now determined. The winner scores the most points as round one ends. Tim Austin leads 4-3. After round one, Tim Austin leads 4-3. Uh, it sounds like Coach Joe Bird expected a different kind of finder here from Strogoff. Well, apparently he expected Strogoff to come out left-handed, soft punch part of his body. He has not done it yet. They adjusted, though, in the corner. Uh, they, they suggested to him that um, he stick with the jab and then try and get that straight left hand in and, and step in with the jab, which is very important for Tim Austin. He's a much better boxer when he does that. A comment from Tim Austin between uh, the first and second round. He said, I'm relaxed. So that's psychologically, I think, uh, Tim Austin's in control, knows that as much as he's a member of the U.S. boxing team, got to be some caution look, look, to uh, stroke off here. Uh, the, the caution yeah, the goes caution went to, to Tim, Tim Austin. Austin. This uh, referee is from Pakistan, Ghaznavi, Mr. Ghaznavi. This has nothing to do with whether an American is fighting or is boxing or not. The refereeing in this tournament has been worse than atrocious. What's worse than atrocious? I don't know, but if I can think of the word, I'll find it for you. I'm, I'm running to my dictionary now. Yes. Uh, a thesaurus might do, too. You, 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 you've made that comment several times looking for a different word. Austin. I'll have to find it. Austin now takes an 8-4 lead. Let me tell you something about this referee. His performance specifically in this, ref in this uh, tournament has been atrocious. In early bouts, he had a number of standing eight counts that were not appropriate and a stoppage that was not appropriate. He's one of the prime uh, suspects of the bad referee. Suspects, okay. 
allegedly. Thank you, Al. Commentary by Al Bernstein. Boxing continues. Round two. Tim Austin now taking a comfortable lead. 9-4. Uh, Tim Austin, young man out of Cincinnati, uh, has a daughter named Tamika. Light of his life, Tim Austin says. He does everything in the world for him. Lectures kids in Cincinnati about the evils of, evils of drug use. In fact, told us a very poignant story about his hero, Aaron Pryor, begging for quarters and dimes and nickels on the streets around the boxing gym in Cincinnati. Tim says there's a man whose life was totally destroyed by drugs. Said that his hero was Aaron Pryor. He's watched the Aaron Pryor Alexis Arguello fight at <laughs> least 150 times. And what he sees in that is the determination of Aaron Pryor. That's what we're seeing here now. Tim Austin now has the plan down to beat Strogoff using a very solid jab and a straight left. Against some other boxer, he might need a more varied attack. Not against this man. That will work, and it'll keep working if he uses it. Austin very collected. Uh, 36 hours ago, there was great steam. There was great anticipation. There was great joy in the U.S. boxing team. And then three straight losses, one very controversial by Eric Griffin, Sergio Reyes losing, also Pepe Riley losing. R really kind of brought the U.S. boxing team down a little bit. And De La Hoya wins. Now Tim Austin is back, putting a little life back in the U.S. boxing team. And he is landing the right hooks and... Uh, the jabs very effectively, and of course he gets another caution. <laughs> From Mr. Gaznavi, that was a caution to Austin for budding. Round two ends, Austin leads. Now a spectator at the Olympics in Barcelona, hoping to once again be a participant. We're trying to keep you posted as best we possibly can in this situation, but as it stands, his best friend, Tim Austin, is now... Uh, the only hope of that duo to continue through this tournament. 12-4 after two rounds. Austin leads. His opponent, Julian Strogoff of Bulgaria in blue. Strogoff uh, stopped his first opponent, a North Korean, with a ref referee stops contest in the second round. He showed good power in that match, Bob, but he has not been able to land the straight right as effectively against Austin as he would like. He did it a moment ago, but there's not been a punch he can get there. There he, he gets one that, that gets close, doesn't get credit for it, but was close to landing. Uh, that's the third warning. That's the third caution. That, oh, that was to the U.S. corner. Excuse me, let's make sure we understand that that was for the U.S. corner, not the Bulgarian corner. They already have two cautions and one more, as you point out. They would, their three points would be added to Tim Austin's score, unlike that left hand, which didn't add a point to his score. Well, yesterday was very suspect in scoring. Today seems to be a little bit more lenient. This is the first fight of the day, and maybe it sets the tone for the judges at ringside. Caution to Austin for a headbutt by the Pakistani referee. One of the maneuvers that Lozano used so effectively against Eric Griffin was holding the right hand when they're on the inside. Strogoff has done some of that also, but Austin hasn't allowed him to. There's a jab by, by Tim Austin. The left hand did land, but the jab didn't. And you know, when you're a jabber, you need to get credit for those jabs. It's very important. Uh, now Tim Austin has uh, Strogoff uh, backing all over the ring. I think Mr. Strogoff knows that uh, he is no match for Tim Austin on this particular day. Austin is one of the strongest 112 pounders. And when his jab is working as it is today, it, it really sets everything up. That's a caution to Strogoff for lowering his head, headbutt. 17-6 the score, final minute of the third round. Well, the 15-day wait, the loss by Eric Griffin. At this point, has not affected Tim Austin again. A caution, ducking below the waist to Strogoff. Austin has kept him backing up the entire match and has pushed him against the ropes about eight or nine times. And when Tim Austin has you on the ropes, he's a very accurate puncher. One. A standing eight count now to Strogoff. Of course, in amateur boxing, a standing eight count counts no more than just a jab in points, but uh, of course, three standing eight counts in a round and the fight is over. Sometimes it doesn't count as much as a jab because we've seen many standing eights in which the punch wasn't counted. Absolutely. We've seen as more than a few. As was the case few. there. Well, Tim Austin, after waiting for 15 days, 
You got a buy in the first round. Uh, now there's some blood coming out of the nose of Strogoff. The referee tries to clean up the mess as best he possibly can. The clock stops. He says box and the clock starts again. Final seconds of this fight. Tim Austin has overcome, I personally feel, a great deal to win his first fight in the 1992 Olympics. He advances in the 112 pound division. Extremely good performance by Tim Austin, especially in light of what you mentioned, Bob, the layoff and the fact that his first round was normally for him a slow one. Here is there is uh, Tim Austin in the last round lunging a little bit, but then getting in with the right hand. Uh, a little lunging there, but he was able to land the right. Yeah, Al, unfortunately, uh, Tim Austin did look a little awkward there on the lunging, but he had to lunge because his opponent was running away from him a little bit. And that was rare. Mostly his, his uh, technique was quite good in this bout. See those checks on the gloves, on the taped hands. They are checked before the fight, and you'll see the referee check the, uh, the taped hands. His buddy Little E taking a picture of Little T. Tim Austin wins. 19 to 7, the final score. Tim Austin at 112 does continue through the boxing tournament. With what happened outside the ring, all concerning Eric Griffin and his second round loss to Rafael Lozano of Spain. Because of a computer printout of the scoring, it really caused a lot of problems, Al, and an awful lot of conversation. Boy, did it ever, and a view of this printout tells you why. Even though Griffin lost, all the judges in their individual computer scorecards had him ahead. But because a punch needs three of the five judges to agree within one second for it to count, only six accepted punches for Lozano, only five for Griffin, though 81 to 50 was the total score. And we might add that the five men of the jury who are the backup system, the scoring under the old system, also all had it for Eric Griffin. That's 10 judges yeah, for Eric Griffin. He still lost. All that prompted the U.S. Boxing Federation to file a protest. It was filed, accepted by the protest committee. They met for two hours, reviewed tapes, computer printouts, came to no decision. That committee turned the protest over to the referee and judges committee. Their conclusion, no reason to overturn the original score. Lozano is the winner. There was one appeal left to the executive committee of the International Amateur Boxing Association. This is the basis for the appeal, Al. As you can see, they said what we said. The jury, uh, backing up the five men that already scored it for Griffin, said yes, Griffin was the winner, 5-0. Also, they felt in the last 30 seconds, Eric Griffin scored a lot of points that simply weren't recorded. Now, the, they recommended at that time that they reverse the decision and just declare Griffin the winner or let him fight Lozano again. And uh, they felt that there was a uh, possibly a malfunction in the machine or that the judges just couldn't respond quick enough, Bob. Meanwhile, Eric Griffin had to sit and wait. When we saw him, he looked drained, Al. You know, it's been a long odyssey for him. Four years, he skipped 1980, or didn't skip it, couldn't perform in 1988 because of the marijuana problem. He got himself back together, was a world champion, and now when we talked to him, he was visibly upset, but still had a lot of resolve. I thought I had a very good chance to, to continue the game, but um, like I said, I'm gonna continue staying here, being here with the, with the USA team, motivating the USA team, still captain of the team, still feeling like a champ. Well, then we had to wait for the final decision from the executive commission, and it came at 6 o'clock. Their conclusion, the appeal was denied. Eric Griffin was out of the Olympics. And that should be where the story would end, we would presume, but not necessarily so. Bob Jordan, his confidant and advisor, found out that the AIBA has a rule that you cannot be over 60 and judge a match. And he feels that one of the judges in this match was over 60. He has threatened to subpoena their passports. And if he proves that the judge is over 60, he said, I'll take legal action and overturn Eric's decision and every other match in which that judge worked. And AIBA won't tell him the ages of the judges. They will not reveal it, but something tells me somewhere along the line, we'll find out how old those judges are. Can we get the boxing? Let's do. In the ring, six U.S. boxers are through to the quarterfinals. At 112, it's Tim Austin. At 132 pounds, Oscar De La Hoya. At 165, Chris Bird. Light heavyweight, Montel Griffin. Heavyweight, Donnell Nicholson. Super heavyweight, Larry Donald. And now, Raul Marquez at 156 pounds is about to enter the ring and hopes to become the seventh 
U.S. boxer into the quarterfinals. And there he is, dress gloves just checked by the officials. Raul Marquez at 156 pounds approaches the ring here in Badalona. His friends and family are waiting. We'll come back with Raul Marquez after these words from your local stations. Yes, at 156 pounds, well, he's not the only one with intensity in his face. The Hispanic contingent covering the U.S. boxing team here, Arturo Marquez, anxiously awaits his son's entrance and best wishes from the company where Arturo Marquez works in Houston, Texas. Best of luck. Knock him out. Knock him dead. As the horns announce at 156 pounds representing the United States out of Houston, Texas, Raul Marquez. There is Veronica, sixth grader in Houston. She has written a story about her brother. In fact, she's written many stories, but the title of this one, A Boxer's Journey to the Olympics, about her big brother, Raul Marquez. His opponent from the Seychelles is Rival Kedo. Kedo is from Victoria Seychelles. If you wonder what they are or where they are, it's a series of 86 islands in the Indian Ocean. They have never won an Olympic medal. He's just one of two fighters in the Olympics for the Seychelles. And just before the start begins, we have Beasley Reese who uh, talked to Joe Bird, heard what advice Joe gave Raul Marquez. Beasley, what did he say? Well, Bob, his top concern is that, you know, Raul is facing a boxer that the U.S. team doesn't know very much about. So, res you know, respecting the unknown is the, is the number one thing that he talked about. The advice was to work off the right jab until they know what this boxer will try to do. Mm. Uh, Marquez's first fight was against a very awkward Nigerian, six feet three inches tall. His name was Dafi Agbo. I'll not mention that name again. <laughs> Raul won 8 7, a very close match. At least Mr. Cado is uh, similar to Raul Marquez's height, Al. He is indeed, and of course, he, he is also a lefty. And in his first match, Raval Cado against uh, Mohamed Nespahi. Uh, was very effective. He was uh, a, a brawler, if you will. He, he landed a lot of good straight left hands, had a lot of power. That would seem to play right into the hands of Raul Marquez. We'll see. Well, he looked tight in his first fight, and then you add that uh, to uh, the tall, gangly Nigerian. And Raul, even though he won, did not look good. And he wasn't embarrassed, but he was concerned about his performance. He has spent a lot of time around our compound. He has watched uh, some tapes provided by the coaching staff of uh, this young man. And Raul is very confident of his chances against Mr. Kedo. This is a much better style for Raul Marquez to face. You mentioned uh, Dafi Agbo was a, a tall, lanky boxer, a right-hander. This is a lefty who is about the same height as Raul Marquez. And Marquez is able to stalk him in a little better fashion. If you've not seen Raul Marquez fight before, his dad showed him marvelous Marvin Hagler tapes when he was a kid growing up. Uh, he shadow boxed like marvelous Marvin Hagler in front of a mirror. He uh, loves imitating Marvin Hagler. Oh, nice right hook by Raul Marquez as he is uh, starting out quickly here on the scoreboard. Raul Marquez has probably as much power as any 156 pounder in the world, in the amateur world, and we saw evidence of that in that right hook. Caution uh, to uh, Cadeau for holding there. The referee is Jack Parcher from Ireland. Third man in the ring. Ooh, that's got to be a standing eight. Raul Marquez, a standing eight, of course, in amateur boxing. One, we've learned from this uh, tournament, he did get credit for the punch. And two, it carries no more weight than a jab. Sometimes it doesn't carry the weight of a punch because they don't count it. That is correct. Of course, that is the official scoring you're seeing. Three out of five judges must agree within one second and punch their their punch their uh, pad, and that will be a punch that counts. Marquez looks a lot more composed, a great deal more composed, a lot more confident. Now, this is the Raul Marquez we saw at the Olympic trials in the box office, willing to stick his head in there, 
take punishment, punishment and deliver it. And you know, the left elbow of Marquez was injured in the box offs in the trial. Some concern coming into the Olympics, but he has thrown the left hand, and we've seen it already in this spot uh, with no apparent pain. Final seconds, round one. Raul Marquez leads 7 1. In red, Raul Marquez. These are 156 pounders. His opponent, Rival Cadu of the Seychelles. 7 1 the score after. Uh, the first period we just gave you an extended look at the, the scoring controversy involving Eric Griffin and Raul Marquez uh, actually the benefactor of good scoring tonight it looks like uh, a lot of punches we've seen landed have in fact counted Al and there's a reason for that Raul Marquez is a left-hander who stays on the outside and lands big power shots his punches are very easy to see, especially against an opponent like Cadeau, who is wide open and who is not crowding him. And against another left-hander, Bob, and we saw it even in the box office in the trials, and Raul Marquez is doubly effective against another lefty. Has a promising career as a pro. As a matter of fact, uh, Lou Duva has been yeah. here in Barcelona. And uh, Mr. Uh, Duba thinks an awful lot of Raul Marquez. There's a caution to Marquez for slapping. <laughs> and Mr. Duba has great things in the future of the boxing career of one Raul Marquez. And one thing we have to say, Marquez, who has had a day or so to compose himself, doesn't appear to be shaken emotionally by the loss of Griffin, the loss of his good friend Sergio Reyes and Pepe Riley. He has his mind on business, just as Oscar De La Hoya did, who had one session and a break from a session to get himself composed. And of course, Joe Bird, the coach, has had something to do with that as well. And the jab of Marquez, very effective. Marquez in red and tries the uppercut there. It does not score, but it's an X there. Well, maybe it did. A delayed reaction. And uppercuts or punches, as Eric Griffin will surely attest to, have not been scored very well by the officials. Nor have the body shots. No, and you know, again, the reason Marquez has landed, uh, scored is because it was from outside. Mm -hmm. The U.S. boxing contingent has been working out in the Athletes Village earlier. Just after they got here, they had a workout uh, building for them, but it was so difficult to get through security, go get dressed, work out, go back, go through security again, that they just decided to find a couple of palm trees and maybe a little shade and work out as best they possibly could. They've stayed very close to uh, the Athletes Village and the NBC compound where the cheeseburgers are free. <laughs> Those and, two places. And good, I might add, as well. Yeah, they do come back, so they must be pretty good. The uh, the jab of Raul Marquez is the, really the story in this spot. And that is what, as Beasley Reese reported, Joe Bird wanted him to do. The jab would set everything up. That's what it's done. Well, after one round, it was 7-1. As we're coming to the close of round two, it's 15-1 in favor of of Raul Marquez. Score after two rounds, 15-1 in favor of Raul Marquez in red. Out of Houston, Texas. Started boxing at the age of nine. Coached by his father, Arturo. Veronica, his sister, is here. Mom, Yolanda, back in Houston. The advice given to Raul Marquez uh, in the corner there by Osmar Alinez, the one of the assistant coaches for the U.S. team, don't take chances. And you know, the, the uh, conventional thinking about Raul is that he tends to take chances, like, likes to get into a slugging match. But we see in this match that he has good boxing skills. And you can box well coming forward. You don't have to be boxing uh, moving backwards. He's using it, coming in behind a very strong jab, keeping his hands up, and doing a good defensive job as well. Uh, now, we did notice uh, between rounds two and three, there was a slight little um, abrasion underneath the left eye of Raul Marquez. Can't really see whether there's a little smear of blood on the left cheek. Does not look serious. Certainly not in a dangerous area, but in amateur boxing, the way the referee protects the, the boxer, you always wonder about any little abrasion anywhere. Mm -hmm. And since I have been absolutely beating up on the, there is uh, referee Jack Poucher coming yeah, over to take a look. It. 
since I've been beating up on these referees, I will say Jack Poucher is one of the better ones, not one of the inept ones, to use a different word than you've heard me use before. He's doing an excellent job in this match. Thank you, Al. I appreciate you switching ad adjectives there. 16-2, 17-2, Marquez piling up the points, and you know, I think you said it correctly, this is a perfect opponent for Raul Marquez, and the opponent, Mr. Cadu, has played his role perfectly. And haven't we seen in this tournament where Americans at the wrong time have run in the wrong kind of opponents? Pepe Riley on that night when, uh, after Griffin lost, the emotion was down. Had he faced a right-hander, Pepe Riley might have done better, but the left-hander gives him trouble. Stop. Not the man he wants to face. In this case, Marquez gets a better style after the tough fight with Daffy Agbo. There was a caution to the blue corner. Cato for coaching from the corner. You can't do that. Marquez... Fought over a hundred times as an amateur and on occasion will spar with uh, some pros in the law in the Houston area. There's a lot of them to find down there. He's looked good tonight. He has looked extremely good. We pointed out that the opponent was good, but still Marquez has followed the game plan perfectly. He has not been wild. He's not been reckless. And his jab has been as good as I've ever seen it. 19 points accumulated by a U.S. boxer in this tournament has been rare. Chris Bird has been the uh, big point getter for the team to this point, but 19 points for Raul Marquez, I think, is the high water mark for scoring for U.S. boxers. Final seconds of round three. And with this win, Raul Marquez is now one win away from the medal round in the 1992 Olympics. Happy with his performance. There's Father Arturo and Lou Duba, both, I think, very pleased with Ra Raul's performance. Both have more than a small vested interest in him, and there is his sister, Veronica, who will have quite a good story to write yes, after she this will. one, won't you? Yes, she will. She sure will. What I did on my summer vacation. <laughs> a little nick under the eye, as you see, but that shouldn't be anything. And the American doctor and trainer have done a great job with cuts and bruises here. And yeah, we saw the little scratch in, uh, strangely, about the same spot for uh, Oscar De La Hoya. Uh, well taken care of. There is Velcro on the boxing gloves. Velcro. Some of the... Uh, Players and participants have, have said that that may be the scraping that's giving them the decision. Raul Marquez becomes the seventh U.S. boxer to advance to the quarterfinals. And uh, the way he advanced was with uh, an array of good shots. Here he lands a, a, a left hand that, in truth, might have been a blow that you might not have counted because it didn't land with the white, but it pushed Cadeau back. There it was a straight left hand that landed the jab in the straight left, the principal weapons for Raul Marquez. And, you know, you could see throughout the days that Raul was not happy with his first fight, was very concerned about it. This has certainly made amends for that. He's with our Beasley Reese. Raul, how have you, you know... You made it look so easy tonight. Was it as easy as it looked? Oh, definitely. I mean, the guy wasn't running for me. And uh, towards the end, he started running, you know, because he felt my power. Right. Anybody that's going to feel my power, they're going to start running. So I got to uh, start up a big lead like I did in the first round. Uh-huh. Now, how have you been able to keep your focus, you know, with all the controversy going on with the U.S. team right now? Well, actually, I was trying to knock him out, you know. I didn't want to take the risk of... Uh, getting a fight ripped off like they did to Eric, you know. Right. Maybe if I would have knocked them down, things would have slowed down for us a little bit. It seems like they got hate towards the United States right now or something. It must be something. I don't know. Okay. Well, congratulations on your fight. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Raul Marquez will fight again on Tuesday. That's it for boxing here. USA versus Spain in basketball with him.